Okay, so thank you all for coming. Welcome to today's digital lunch and learn called physics research activities at Sanford Underground Research Facility. Um, just some housekeeping things before we get started. This event will be recorded and we'll get it uploaded to our YouTube channel afterwards for viewing. Um, everyone is always curious who's here. So please use the chat function to say hi. Um, if you can list your class year and major, um, everyone's always curious. So um, with that, with that being said, let's please welcome Dr. Reichenbacher and also joining us is physics department head, Dr. Snee and Dr. Streeter to answer any questions that one may have. So you're good. Yeah, hello, welcome everyone. I see that there are 36 participants right now. Well, 32 if we count, uh, if we don't count us, that's a pretty good turnout, I think. Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity in the physics department to present what work we're doing at the uh, Sanford uh, lab at the underground research facility, the former home state mine, as it's also known. And then I give a presentation now, and afterwards uh, we have some uh, 10 minutes or so time for questions and answers. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I hope it works now. Let me go to full screen mode. Is that a full screen mode now? Yep, you're good. Okay, good. So this webinar, this digital lunch and learn, it's not lunch yet, uh, but hopefully afterwards. So I will talk about the research activities that are physics centric at Sanford Underground Lab. There are also other activities there in biology and geology that I will not address now, uh, as I'm not an expert in the other fields. So I'm just gonna talk about the physics research activities there. My name is Jürgen Reichenbacher, and I work since 2014 on two experiments that we're gonna conduct at the Sanford uh, lab, the Dune neutrino experiment and the LC dark matter experiment. So for neutrinos, first of all, what is a neutrino particle and uh, since when do we know of that actually? So in the 1930s, Wolfgang Pauli postulated theoretically the neutrino particle because there was an observation that in the beta decay, a radioactive decay, as you see here in that spectrum, there was a continuous energy spectrum. If you just have a two body decay, there should be discrete line of energy, but there was a continuous spectrum. So which means there must be third particle at play so that the energy and the momentum can be distributed at the continuous energy spectrum. And uh, he postulated that as a neutral and massless particle and called it neutrino, actually neutrino but then you know, it was difficult to pronounce, so it eventually became neutrino. And he at the time thought that this is a particle that's so elusive and light that it will never ever be detectable. And he also postulated massless because at the end point here of the beta spectra, there was no deviation from what was theoretically expected. So it should also have mass zero and not only be neutral and weakly interacting. So it's a very elusive particle that people thought one can never detect. However, with the ascent of nuclear reactors in the 1950s, it was possible to make a strong neutrino source, which nuclear reactors are also. Uh, it's a byproduct uh, neutrinos, electron anti neutrinos, actually. And they were discovered, and a Nobel Prize in the mid 90s was awarded for that to Cohen and Rains. And you see here where neutron neutrinos are produced, you have a, a large nucleus like uranium and in the uh, induced fission, you see you get beta decays, the neutron is split in a proton and electron, and you can also get an electron antineutrino out of that. And so you get lots of neutrinos that just escape the reactor core because they're so weakly interacting. So they're not interacting in any of the shielding. So they're usually hard to catch, but I manage because it's such a strong source of neutrinos to actually measure them and detect them, uh, which you know was a Nobel Prize in the mid 90s. So it's actually recently was acknowledged. So it's fairly young, the research of neutrino physics. 
Aside from nuclear reactors, the sun itself also uses uh, uh, nuclear reactions to produce uh, the energy from which we all live on the planet Earth here too. And so instead of uh, splitting atoms, which we do in a nuclear reactor, you can also fuse atoms. And that's what a sun does, fuses two protons or so hydrogen together to make, uh, you can make burn helium out of this. And uh, you call this fusion. And that's what happens in the core of the sun at 50 million degree Kelvin and at a large density of 150 grams per cubic centimeters. And you see, you can build up uh, here from uh, fusing uh, hydrogen. You can start building up larger nuclei, although with small branching ratios. And here, the attention goes to boron-8, for example. And boron-8 now can undergo a beta decay, where you get a neutrino as a byproduct, not only an electron here, positron, a positively charged one, you get actually an electron neutrino here out. There are also other uh, elements that you can produce where you get an electron neutrino like beryllium-7 here. And, uh, but this is the most important for what has been discovered, uh, solar, neutrino, uh, solar neutrinos at the uh, former Homestick mine with the Ray Davis chlorine experiment that I'm going to talk in a moment about, because it's a uh, historic our site at Sanford Lab. The Homestick mine was actually site for an experiment that detected solar neutrinos, and uh, the Nobel Prize has been awarded to that, which I'll mention in a bit more detail in a few slides. And so the electron neutrinos, particular from the Born 8 beta decay, they can actually now be detected. And you see here the spectra of uh, neutrinos that are produced in the sun. And uh, this is a double logarithmic plot. So a lot of the fluxes here at very low energies, way below one mega electron volt. But the born eight neutrinos here, they have energies up to more than 10 MeV. So it's easier to catch them, detect them in the detector. And so that's what has been done in the home state mine with a chlorine uh, target. And you see, you can basically catch here from about one MeV onwards and above the neutrinos from boron-8. And that was done in Davis' experiment that I'll show a bit in more in detail here in the next slide. So you see here how solar neutrinos for the very first time were detected here in South Dakota at the Homestake mine in the 60s, late 60s, 70s, and 80s. So you see here this large tank, which was filled with tetrachloroethylene, so that contains chlorine here. And it's actually detergent, a laundry detergent that's being used. And so it was available easily. Uh, commercially. And so 600 tons of that were filled in that tank, which was located underground at the 4850 level at the cavern that we now call Davis Cavern, after Ray Davis, the uh, private, uh, the investigator uh, for the uh, Homestake chlorine detector. He came from Brookhaven and he actually really spent a lot of time here on site, hands on making this experiment work principal investigator. And you see here electron neutrinos, just like in a chemical reaction, they can interact with uh, nucleus chlorine 37, and then they make argon 37 and an electron. And this type of experiment, we cannot see the electron directly. So what we see is actually the argon that we can extract. So it's a radiochemical experiment. So chemically, we extract this argon element that has been produced. And we bubble it basically with helium and get it out and then put it in little proportional counters and then count the radioactive decay here of argon 37 because that has a half-life of 35 days, just over a month. So externally in little counters, we actually count the radioactive decay of that. And whenever we find one of those decays outside in our detectors, we know we had uh, measured a neutrino there. And that's basically how uh, the solar neutrinos have been discovered. It was pretty rock and roll at the time. 
to say, I'm gonna go deep underground to measure neutrinos from the sun. And it was a crazy idea, but he really fully took it on and you know, managed to succeed. So here you see a rendition of a French uh, artist's vision of the Homestake experiment. It looks more like a tunnel, right? Like in the Alps. So here we know it's actually different. It's a real mine where you go down vertically a cage. You see the tank here, and it has to be surrounded uh, with water to shield the radioactivity from the surrounding rock. So you not only have to go deep underground to shield the uh, radiation from cosmic ray that can upset your detector, and make you fake uh, counts in your, uh, in your little proportional counters. But uh, not only deep underground, you also have to then, when you're underground, shield also the uh, radioactivity from the surrounding rock. And that was done in this case with just submerging the entire tank with a target of that chlorine uh, detergent in water. And you see here, actually, Ray Davis, at the time, he took a bath in there and tested the water shield. So that's actually really him here. And so not only did he detect solar neutrinos for the very first time, which was groundbreaking, also by comparison, comparing to uh, the theoretical uh, expectation how many neutrinos should be measured, you see that's here, up here, so many neutrinos, that's the neutrino rate that should be measured from the sun he measured only about a third of that. And as the years went by, or even decades, it was an experiment went on for a long time, way into the 80s, uh, it became clear that this is really a significant deficit. And for decades, this was known as the solar neutrino puzzle. It was great to detect solar neutrinos, but why are there so significantly less, about a third, half or a third than what we expect? So this was long time known for the solar neutrino puzzle. And so it was one of the leading hypotheses was that neutrinos do have a mass and they can actually oscillate. And then we see only one type of neutrino left over. And that's the reason why we measure less than predicted. And so it was not only that he discovered a uh, solar neutrinos for the very first time. It was also new physics that has been discovered because neutrinos do have a very small, but they do have a mass and that's groundbreaking. Another experiment in Japan, Kamuyu Kanto confirmed this. And uh, the, so the leading resolution to the solar neutrino puzzle where neutrino oscillations, where if neutrinos have a mass and they're actually different between the different types of neutrinos, they can actually change their flavor an electron neutrino can then appear as a new neutrino, for example. And then in this chlorine experiment, you would not see it because you only would see the electron type neutrinos. And 2002, Ray Davis became the Nobel Prize awarded for this uh, huge discovery together with uh, Kushiba, the spokesperson of the uh, Kamiokande experiment. So just to mention, there has been a Nobel Prize awarded already for research that has been conducted at uh, the Homestake Mine, now known as the Sanford Underground Research Facility. To explain a little bit more, and also why we're doing the do neutrino experiment now here, I go a little bit into uh, the particle model. You see we have quarks, up and down quarks, that make nucleons like protons and neutrons. And we have leptons like an electron, but also the uh, neutrinos that go with the same flavors, an electron neutrino, muon, and muon neutrino, tau and tau neutrino. And there are three generations of matter. And so the resolution in the late 90s was given from the Homestake experiment and other experiment, mostly the Kamiokande experiment in Japan, that really the explanation is neutrinos do have a mass, their masses between the different uh, mass, the mass eigenstates are different. And so what can happen now is that uh, the flavor eigenstates, which are superposition of the mass eigenstates, they can now after a certain distance appear in a different flavor eigenstate with a certain probability. So to visualize this is if an electron neutrino would always be green, right? In the jelly beans here, 
then the simple model that we have three different jars with different colors of jelly beans really is too simplified. What happens is they're an admixture. So we have jars of so much green electron, so much yellow uh, muon neutrinos, and so much you know, tau neutrinos, and so on and so forth. There are three mass eigenstates that are superpositions. And so that can then mean mostly you detect them maybe as an electron neutrino, but depending on the energy and distance, you can detect them as a yellow jello bean, so a muon neutrino instead of an electron neutrino. Mathematically, this is just a rotation of the two states, the uh, flavor eigenstates of neutrinos, as a uh, rotation between the mass eigenstates here of the neutrinos. It's a bit complicated, but what it means, if here's the sun and here we are at a distance at the earth, then you see here, put here home stake, for example, it's just very simplified uh, two flavor model. And it's actually a bit more complicated processes than the sun. But you know, you see we're starting with electron neutrinos. And then as we go towards the earth, they disappear and another flavor of neutrinos starts to become. So we see a reduction here of our electron neutrinos and an increase here of mu neutrinos. And that explained why we can then measure here on earth less electron neutrinos than we actually expect because some are hiding in a different flavor that with one that type of experiment, that chlorine experiment, we're only sensitive to one type of the flavor, the electron neutrinos we could not see. So that was the resolution. And this probability depends on the distance and the energy and the difference in masses. And that's important because you know you will see in a moment that distance, uh, for example, to Chicago is very relevant when we have a certain mixing angle and a certain uh, squared mass difference and a certain energy of neutrinos. And it just matches nicely for future research, the distance from Chicago to, uh, to uh, lead in South Dakota. So we have actually three types of uh, neutrino flavors that are superpositions of three mass eigenstates of neutrinos. It's a three by three matrix in reality. And we can break this down, we can factorize this into three different mixing angles. One which we call solar, after the discovery of the solar neutrino uh, oscillations. One that we call atmospheric, after the discovery of uh, using atmospheric neutrinos. And then we have a very small mixing angle that has just recently, a few years ago, been discovered where I was involved in an experiment in France and in China and in South Korea. And so the future DUNE experiment at Sanford Lab can probe now all of those mixing angles, including now new things that we can test. For example, the matter under uh, matter asymmetry that we observe in our universe. We are made of matter, but why is there not an equal amount of antimatter? That's weird. So that's something which we don't understand yet. And uh, CP violation, so that's basically matter under matter asymmetry uh, for neutrinos could potentially explain this. And you see here some little faces here as factors to those mixing angles and uh, uh, the second uh, factor here. And if that's not, uh, if that's basically non-zero, we can actually make a measurement if the other factor here, the third mixing angle here is large enough then we can actually access this and make a measurement here at the Sanford Underground Research Facility. And that turned out to be a few years ago, the case that it's large enough. And it also defined that we can make this measurement that the ideal distance to make this measurement is actually uh, Chicago to South Dakota. And so here you see in the Big Bang Theory how this measurement was recently acknowledged here. This was the measurement in France I was uh, engaged in. So it's one of my results here on the whiteboard. I didn't write it there, but someone actually did. So we didn't get a credit for the most uh, significant with the smallest error result, but we had a first one and we were also the first to be acknowledged on this uh, CBS show. So at least that is very something to be uh, happy about, even though the Chinese experiment got a smaller error, but later. Okay, so I mentioned that 
with this knowledge of this new mixing angle that we measured, it turns out that the distance, which is about 800 miles from Chicago to uh, the former Homestead mine, is ideal to make actually this measurement to look for this matter antimatter asymmetry, the CP violation in the neutrino sector. So this is not in the neutrino sector in the universe. Uh, we have, that's referring to baryonic matter that makes up uh, nuclei, but there are mechanisms proposed where neutrinos, if there are more neutrinos than anti-neutrinos, if the CP violation there can actually, during the Big Bang, result in a matter antimatter symmetry for baryonic ma uh, matter, which you know is what we are made up of, mostly protons and neutrons in the nuclei. And so that's why this is a very interesting subject uh, fundamental research to understand which should help us also to understand why we observe in our universe much more matter than antimatter and why we actually basically exist otherwise you know matter and antimatter would just annihilate and then we just radiation in the universe basically and also the neutrino mass ordering is not solved we don't know which of the neutrinos is the lightest or the heaviest and so to visualize this, when we plot this here, we have two scenarios left over. So one of the uh, neutrinos could be the lightest or it could be the heaviest. And so in one case, if you order it one, two, three, we call this a normal hierarchy. And uh, then the electron neutrino would be the lightest, but uh, there could also be the inverted hierarchy where it's just the opposite where here in U3, the town is actually the, uh, the lightest. So we don't actually know which neutrino is the lightest or the heaviest. We also don't know if neutrinos and antineutrinos are not identical because there's also a proposed theory by Majorana that says that neutrinos and antineutrinos are in principle identical. They just distinguish themselves by the handedness, whether they're left handed or right handed. So we don't know this yet. And there's also an experiment at Sanford Lab uh, that has been conducted. It's still actually ongoing. It's called a Majorana demonstrator that just investigates the nature of the neutrino if it's identical to its own undead particle. And recently we also learned the absolute uh, upper limit on the electron neutrino is less than one electron volt. So it's 500 thousandths of the mass of an electron and smaller than that. So it's really minuscule. And it's really amazing how with the neutrino oscillation effect, the quantum mechanics effect, we are sensitive to such teeny tiny amounts of masses. So what is CP invariance? So that's pretty difficult. So I would try to explain this with this Escher plot. So if the white birds, for example, fly from the left to the right, if we use the mirror, the P operator here, parity operator, then the white birds would now fly from the right to the left. So it's basically a mirror. And C, that's the charge, makes it the, uh, the C operator, makes it antimatter. So the white birds would become anti-white birds or black white birds. So they fly now here, the black birds on the left to the right, and the white birds here before the C operator fly from the left to the right too, but they're white and here they're black, so they're anti-birds. And if we do both C, P, and P as operator, then the white birds flying from left to the right are now black birds that fly from the right to the left. That's basically what it means, the uh, CP operator. So for neutrinos, they have a handedness, they have momentum and spin. And so neutrinos is left-handed, that's what it means. And if you make parity, it gets right-handed. It's under particle has to be right-handed. And uh, so if you do the charge parity, it changes, basically becomes an anti-neutrino. And so the question is, so the charge makes it just anti and parity changes the handedness. So the question is, if for example, left-handed neutrinos and right-handed anti-neutrinos that would be a CP in a CP operation. And so the question is, 
do neutrinos interact in the same fashion, now likely they act the same way as uh, the antineutrinos, for example. And we do know it's a complicated effect that the CP violation does occur for quarks, but we have not observed that yet for neutrinos. And Majorana would mean, I explain this also a little bit later when we go to the Majorana demonstrate experiment, that left-handed neutrinos and right-handed antineutrinos are basically identical. They just distinguish themselves by the handedness, right? So uh, there still can be then CP violation, but they are identical to their undead particle. And it's probably too fast to really fully comprehend this, but I at least want to give the idea what's relevant here and why we're probing this and why we're dealing with uh, matter and antimatter, so neutrinos and antineutrinos and the various jargon of uh, charge that makes it a charge operator, which makes it antimatter and parity, which is basically a mirror operation. So where do we probe this? We probe this in the former Homestake mine, which is now called Sanford Underground Research Facility. You see here lead, you see here the open cut, and you see here the Yates complex and the Ross complex. And if we make a vertical slice at the 4850 level, we have near the Yates shelf, the Davis campus, where we have the former Lux experiment, and now we're conducting the LC experiment there. There's also the Majorana demonstrator. And at the uh, Ross uh, campus, accessed by the Ross shaft, we will build a Dune experiment. There is CASPA located, and also the uh, Black Hills underground campus. So for Dune, which I will talk first about, so we will have, and that's currently going on, we're excavating huge caverns to host four large detectors, one, two, three, four. And then there's a lot of access drifts and central and Chile caverns, so a lot has to be excavated. And that's fully in swing right now, which is very exciting. See here, shot crate inspection, a drilling, shaft operator. And there's also, when you drive by in lead now, you see a conveyor belt going across the uh, road, uh, near the museum, and uh, which is dumping, you know, the excavated rock into the open cut. And that's going on since April this year, which is very exciting, but things are really moving now. We also went after the blasts uh, that were performed, and which are still ongoing, but they were in the proximity of uh, when you get down at the Ross campus and exit a cage. So we could not access, uh, for example, the Black Hills Underground Campus or CASPA also at Mothballed right now due to this. And you see here, we checked out after the blasts, uh, the uh, Black Hills Underground Campus, which was sealed off here with uh, steel plates. And that's me going in through a hedge like an archeological span excavation. That's Brianna Mount from Black Hills State, uh, who is the uh, principal investigator of the Black Hills Underground Campus and some of my students here that uh, we are loading some of my equipment that we had uh, on carts to get it back out and relocate them at Sanford Lab. You see here, because of the blast and still you no know, silicate in the air, we really had to wear mask, filter moss, we'll filter moss all the time uh, because of the, the hazard due to the sharp uh, silicate particles in the air. So it's not very pleasant. There's also no electricity anymore, no AC. So it was a really sweaty, difficult job. And we hauled them uh, all the equipment out. But it was exciting. And we could then see the miners at work, how they really excavate and blast their way through and are mucking the rock and getting out, uh, getting that out of the, uh, uh, out of the mine. Those caverns will be huge. So this is one detector module of four, how it looks like. It's uh, 60 meters long and it's about uh, 40 meters high and about 40 meters wide. So this four, so it's basically four stories high and the cross section here would be an Olympic size swimming pool, right? So it's huge, it's kind of a size of a dorm here on campus. And they contain uh, time projection chambers, which have a cathode and an anode, and there's liquid organ in there, noble gas, where 
if neutrinos interact there, charge is produced that we can drift to the uh, anode and read out with wires. And we can also use light detectors. And here you see a typical wire readout with the wire number here on the x-axis and the time here on the y-axis. And you see a mu neutrino makes a nice mu track here. It's very easy to see in this time projection chamber. That's where the name comes from, time projection chamber, because you visualize a track actually. And an electron neutrino looks differently here. It's lots of uh, branching and forking here because it makes an electromagnetic shower. So we can actually really visually distinguish between electron neutrinos and mu neutrinos. And so in Chicago, we'll produce mu neutrinos, and then we'll measure how many mu neutrinos we'll, uh, we'll get here, uh, 800 miles from the production. And we also see how many electron neutrinos show up due to the oscillation effect. And then we can do the same thing with anti-mu neutrinos and see how many mu uh, neutrinos we measure again and how many electron antineutrinos we measure again. And so that's how we can then compare matter and antimatter for neutrinos and study if the properties are different or change. So if there's a CP violating effect or not. And we can also by just looking at the statistics, the, making the accounting how many uh, neutrinos in measure of a certain kind, we can also resolve actually the hierarchy which neutrino is the heaviest and which is the lightest. But in order to achieve that background control for radioactivity that can upset our detectors is paramount. So here at the school, we have a high throughput uh, of, uh, of, al of, of samples that we can assay with our germanium detectors and alpha uh, ray spectrometers here in our lab. And you see here, one of the germanium detectors that has to be cooled with liquid nitrogen. And here, one of the alpha spectrometers here that we can use to uh, assay rock, but we can also use this to say detector components when we build detector and assemble it together to make sure there's not too much radioactivity there. So it's not as easy as just taking a piece of rock that's just from the uh, blast, some rock that we took to count the radioactivity. So we cannot just stick it on the detector and just count it. We could, but it would not be very informative. We want to have a more precise result. So we have to crush them up here, pre-crush them. And then it goes in the rock crusher at Mineral Industries where it gets a fine powder. So this is really a hard rocking job here that we're doing. And then we fill it in bottles and then those bottles in a well-defined geometry can go on the germanium detector and we can then make a gamma spectroscopy measurement to see how much radioactivity and of what type is actually in the rock. And we do the same with the shot grade materials so that we can actually select which vendor, which shot grade is the most advantageous to minimize the external radioactivity backgrounds that we have for the Duna experiment. And here, this is uh, an intern, an RU over the summer that has worked here, Faith Beal from Texas AMM. So we're actually attracting even students now from Texas to come here and work. You see there are three rocks from the excavated site from different uh, locations. And they were smashed up again, crushed, we also use the uh, X-ray analysis, the capability that Mineral Industries has for XIF and XRD analysis uh, to get the chemical composition in addition to uh, the radioactivity content that we get with here, the germanium detector, for example, to make gamma ray spectroscopy. And you see once it's crushed up, you see that those three rock samples actually have very different colors. And they actually, when you make the measurements, you see they're actually very different despite here. Uncrushed, they look actually very much the same. So the Dune experiment will be ongoing, ongoing and uh, for the next several decades. The mass hierarchy will probably resolve within a few years of running, but uh, it probably takes about five years, several years, five years maybe from now to build a first detector module. And so there we still have to hold our breath. Our priority here is to make sure that we build the best possible detector for the measurements we wanna do. And within a few years of running with uh, two detector modules, we should be able to resolve the mass hierarchy if we do our job right and build a detector right and have not too much radioactivity, 
contents in there or some wire frames that fail. And there are many million things that you can think of that can actually complicate uh, this uh, detector. We've built prototypes at CERN at about 10% of the mass scale, and they actually worked very well, which is very encouraging. I mean, so that we know we can actually, in principle, the technology works and we can actually make this work. And we are involved uh, also other faculty, David Martinez and uh, Jingbo Van. They're also involved in Dune and they're also uh, involved in research at the prototypes at Geneva at the CERN Research Center where they are located. So this is a long ongoing effort and it will span the next several decades. And the first measurement we can probably make maybe within five years or so. And uh, it's gonna be then very exciting. The mass hierarchy will be resolved fairly quickly within a few years of running for the CP violating uh, effect. So matter under matter, if neutrinos and under neutrinos behave much different than what we expect, if there's any symmetry there, this effect will take actually much more running, will take sort of decade or decades to get a good resolution to that. But if Dune will provide the best possible measurement for that. And it's designed for that. In addition to that, Dune can also measure neutrinos in case we have a supernova explosion in our galaxy. We can also measure again solar neutrinos and there are new exciting effects that we might want to study that are not fully understood yet. And there might be even discoveries of solar neutrinos again. And particular for that background control, radioactivity control is paramount because of the lower energy that those solar neutrinos have compared to the beam neutrinos that are produced in Chicago. So then I want to go on to the uh, neutrino list double beta decay experiment that probes if neutrinos and anti neutrinos are actually identical or not. And if they're Majorana type, which means neutrinos and anti neutrinos would be identical or not. And so that's why the experiment at Sanford Lab that investigates this is called Majorana. And because it's on a smaller scale, it's called a Majorana demonstrator to demonstrate a technology that's located at a Davis campus. And you see here a little tower of germanium detectors in those copper uh, assemblies. And it's about uh, 40 to 50 kilograms of germanium detectors and 30 kilograms of which are enriched. So uh, with the isotope that's relevant for this neutrino as double beta decay. So what does that mean, neutrino double beta decay? Why are we doing this studying this decay in order to determine if neutrinos are Majorana, so if they're identical to the uh, antiparticles or not. So here is the Feynman diagram. You see neutrons, they have a double neutron decay. You get electrons and you get electron antineutrinos out of this. And this happens, we know that, but if neutrinos and antineutrinos are identical, what can happen is that the uh, neutrino, uh, the electron under neutrino from one decay and the other can just absorb itself and you're just getting two electrons with well-defined kinetic energies. So instead of here for the beta decay where we have a continuous energy spectrum, we will now see a line here at about 2 mV for germanium. And if we see this line here popping up, that can only mean it's from this decay here of discrete energy of those two electrons, which add up to just about two MeV. And so by studying this neutrinos double beta decay, where we screen the region about two MeV for germanium here, if we see this line popping up in addition to the continuous beta decay spectrum, that helps us. If that happens here, we know neutrinos and antineutrinos have to be identical. Only then this could happen. So you're looking basically for this line here to show up. And so of course, there's a lot of other background lines here. So the key here is to reduce the background to have no any other line, any complication here, just the one that you wanna look for. And that is actually so complicated that the copper itself is a large source of radioactivity. So here, Cabot and Christofferson from the School of Mines, she was actually the principal investigator to electroform the copper underground at 4850 level. And you see the copper is grown underground, shielded from cosmic rays, 
and just grown fresh without any radioactivity content, basically. And then that's machined with a special tool shop underground. And then worse than that, it has to be assembled in a glove box under the atmosphere, dust free and under the atmosphere that uh, no radioactivity can actually play it out on any or dust can uh, uh, deposit on any of the materials because dust also is radioactive. Air is radioactive, uh, there's radon in there and it's uh, decayed odors and dust uh, can also contain uranium and other uh, radioactive isotopes. So that is a nightmare you see to have to assemble this, those little towers with the wires in a glove box under this atmosphere and even bring, and in addition you see if people have worked in a glove box, they're actually wearing gloves above the glove. So it's kind of really a nightmare. And they're doing this at a Davis campus and they have done a great job and assembled it in 2019. They had already a nice result on the neutrinos double beta decay with their Majorana demonstrator. And that's what you see here. So as a function of the lightest neutrino, you can measure the effective neutrino mass, which you know you do when you search for uh, the neutrinos double beta decay. And they have not found it, but with germanium experiments, they could prove that they could set a very good limit here on the effective neutrino mass for Majorana. And, uh, we see there are other isotopes for other experiments and there are errors here. The problem is there's uncertainty in the nuclear matrix elements in the transitions. So you wanna actually have ideally more than one isotopes to compare with if you see the, uh, the neutrinos double beta K and then wanna postulate that you've discovered that neutrinos and antineutrinos are identical. So you wanna actually have different types of isotopes where the uncertainties are slightly different. And so the errors here, they didn't know what the result is as a function of the uncertainty in those nuclear matrix elements. And you see that's kind of quite a bit of a range here. You can set a limit here, but due to the uncertainty, it goes all the way from here to here, the limit. And you see things are actually more complicated depending on the hierarchy, which is the lightest or the heaviest neutrino. You get here the inverted hierarchy band and the normal hierarchy band in red. And so in case there's a normal hierarchy where the electron field would be the lightest, you can go all the way down here, principally effective neutrino mass that you would have to probe with the neutrinos double beta decay experiments. You see the current best limits are up here, so you can barely probe the inverted hierarchy. So this is one of the big problems that I have now. They have to make their experiments so much bigger to be able to even get down here to probe the inverted hierarchy, not to mention how to go down to the normal hierarchy and probe this. By the way, LC will also get a good limit on that with xenon. It's not only looking for dark matter, we can also use our xenon target to look for neutrinos double beta decay in xenon. And so the plan is for the Diane Majorana demonstrator to go and build a next generation experiment, which is called Legend. And that has about a ton of germanium and they would be able to just go here below the inverted hierarchy to probe this. And they will join, join their forces with the competitor experiment Gerdo. And so the best technical solutions from both experiments are picked for Legend. So that's a real nice uh, synergy. And uh, School of Mines with Kevin and Christofferson is uh, involved big time in this effort. So here, that's the LC experiment here, which will also within a few years of running, get actually a very nice result using xenon. But you see, even if you get our limit, but it's still compatible with the uncertainty that we will get with what's already obtained by the Majorana uh, demonstrator limit here. There's an overlap here. But that's the reason why you wanna have quite many isotopes to kind of uh, probe the uncertainty due to the uh, nuclear matrix element calculations. CASPA is the underground accelerator where the School of Mines is also big time involved. Frank Streeter is the PI of the project. And that's a compact accelerator system for performing astrophysical research. That's the acronym. And you see here at the Ross campus, just across from the Black Hills underground campus, you see here the accelerator, Fantagraph accelerator, the accelerator line at the target and then the detectors to measure the uh, products uh, uh, due to the interaction in the target, neutrons and gamma rays that are produced. 
And that is being used to study uh, stellar neutron sources in a laboratory, basically. And it helps us to understand the origin of the elements. And so what does that mean? Here's the isotopic abundance as a function of mass number, right? So hydrogen here, heavy elements here. And so it's really not clear how the isotopic abundance from the Big Bang came about. You just, so you have to go through stellar burning to build up heavier nuclei. And it's clear. Uh, but it's not clear how we can explain the abundance that we observe. And so here, in, for larger heavy elements, half of them are actually produced in supernova explosions. What happens is the so-called R, the rapid process. So what happens is in a supernova explosion, basically the uh, electrons are pressed into the protons and make neutrons. You get a lot of neutrinos that trigger actually the explosion, which we can actually detect with a Dune experiment if that happens in our galaxy. But you get a lot of neutrons now. So the neutron flux is high. And so you can have from the elements, they can absorb a lot of N uh, neutrons, so through N gamma reactions, to build up you know, uh, elements with a larger uh, mass number. And that does do it so rapidly before they can actually decay with a beta decay. That's the R process. And that half of that happens actually in a supernova. Half of the abundance that we observe comes from a super, comes typically from supernova explosions. And uh, the other half uh, uh, comes presumably from the slow process, the S process, which is helium burn, burning in uh, the uh, asymptotic giant branch stars. And that's basically during the evolution of stars in the hashbone russell diagram, where they go from a certain temperature like the sun, they go up basically during their, uh, when they evolve in their lifetime, uh, they, they become hotter in temperature and have more luminosity, then they go back again, uh, less luminous, uh, lower temperature, and they can reach this asymptotic branch here. And during that time, you have the helium burning and it's also thermally pulsed. And that's a state where it can create a lot of neutron flux, a high neutron flux. And so then this can also happen. But uh, the, the S process is a little bit slower because uh, basically you will have beta decays. You have uh, and gamma reactions and beta decays that happen. Unlike the R process where it's so fast uh, that you get more and more neutrons uh, added to the nucleus before the beta decays can actually occur. That's why it's called a slow process here. And then there are also other processes where just a proton uh, gets absorbed, which Casper can uh, actually probe. And so how does this happen if, for example, an alpha or you know, an alpha N reaction here can actually in the slow, uh, in the slow process, so in the uh, AGB, the asymptotic giant branch, uh, uh, where you get a slow process where you get a neutron flux that allows you also to build up heavy elements. So where does the neutron flux come from? From alpha N reaction. So the fusion of an alpha, which comes in with a nucleus and then a neutron comes out, for example. And that is what uh, Caspar can actually study. You can study those cross sections and measure them in an energy range where it's really interesting for this reaction that happens at a stage of stellar burning uh, where this is relevant to build up, uh, have a neutron flux that's large enough to slowly build up heavier uh, elements, which the super is the source of the other half of the abundance of heavy elements that we're seeing. And those are the measurements that Caspar can uniquely do because they're underground, so they can measure this cleanly in an energy range without uh, the background from cosmic rays. Uh, where otherwise at a surface accelerator, you'd not be able to do this. There would be too much background and much upset of your detectors to measure this uh, alpha N reaction, for example, in this case. Caspar can also study other key reactions uh, by either using protons or alphas uh, to accelerate and smashing it into various types of targets and then measure how much neutrons come out or gammas to measure the cross sections. So Caspa is currently mothballed because of the excavation at, uh, that are going on for Dune. Uh, 
However, they will uh, also resume soon and uh, will make more measurements. In the meantime, in the Davis campus, where the Davis experiment was the chlorine experiment and where the, uh, the former Lux dark matter experiment was, where also the Marijuana demonstrate experiment is, we currently are building the LC dark matter experiment, the generation two dark matter experiment, the successor experiment of Lux. And instead of a small mass of just a few hundred kilograms of xenon that we had for Lux, we have now ordered 10 tons of mass of xenon. That's a huge amount of, uh, of uh, xenon. And uh, xenon is very radio pure. So the more you have, you actually gain much more because it's self shielding, so to speak. Because it's so radio pure, the more you have, uh, the more you have an inner large fiducial volume that is basically free of radioactive decays that you can use to look for dark matter interactions because we have indirect observations of dark matter from astronomical observations. For example, from the rotation of our galaxy, and why we have our galaxy, uh, also from gravitational lensing, but we still have not detected the particles themselves that we would attribute to uh, dark matter particles. And the uh, most common hypothesis is that dark matter particles are massive. They must have matter, right? It's not visible, so they are weakly interacting. So they're called weakly interacting massive particles, so-called WIMPs. And in order to detect those WIMPs, we have our xenon volume in a time projection chamber, and that's surrounded by an anti-counter of liquid scintillator and water. And the water shield is the same here, the water tank as we used for the Lux experiment. We have uh, conduits for calibration sources, where we can bring radioactive sources in and take them out to make dedicated calibrations to understand the response of our detector and what the backgrounds would look like. We also have a DD generator, a fusion of deuterions that we can use to make neutrons because neutrons, that's a background that just mimics the interaction of so-called WIMPs. So that's why we also want to measure what the interaction of WIMPs would look like. So that's why we have also dedicated neutron calibration sources. And so how does that work? A time projection chamber here, a dual phase time projection chamber. Actually, here's the liquid xenon and the cylinder. They're photomultipliers on top and bottom, so an area of photomultipliers. They're very photosensitive. And you see the slide that's produced in an action of a particle, I hopefully a win, right? There's light produced and charge produced. And the light we can immediately detect as an S1 signal, an immediate signal, light signal, and then we have a high voltage here, creates an electric field. So we can drift the electrons, just like in Dune, we can drift the electrons to the anode that's positively charged and read it out there. However, in a dual phase, we start to accelerate them again in the gaseous phase. We don't not only have a liquid phase, we also have a gaseous phase. We start to accelerate there and we amplify actually now the amount of light particles that we're producing for this electron luminescence effect, similar as in LED. So you get much more light for this delayed S2 signal, an amplified signal here. And uh, that helps us a lot to understand the, uh, the nature of uh, the uh, particle that interacted because different types of particles, different ratios of S1, the first direct light to S2, the delayed amplified light from the charge that has been drifted. And so the typical plot that we use for this is on the x-axis, the first direct light S1 on the y-axis, for example, the S2 light on a logarithmic scale. And you see, that uh, radioactive backgrounds make so-called electron recoils. We get this blue band here, this ratio. And for neutron backgrounds or dark matter signals, they should show up here in this red band because they have a different ratio between S2 and S1 compared to radioactive backgrounds that uh, make electron recoils. So by having this red band well separated from the blue band, we have a clear region of interest where we can look, for example, for dark matter particles. And we can use calibration sources, radio calibration sources to map out this electron band. And we can use, uh, for example, neutron sources to map out this red uh, uh, nuclear recoil band that we would expect for dark matter interactions. 
So here at the School of Mines, we contributed to the efforts at LC big time. So you see in the left top, the radon reduction system to reduce the radioactivity in air. So the air that was used for the assembly in uh, Sanford lab was radon free and the Schnee group assembled a radon reduction system for that. And uh, also the materials were assayed to see how much radon actually emanates out of the materials that use the building detector that was also done in the Schnee group. And uh, myself with together with Dr. Bai and Dr. Schnee in our group, we also did the dust control because dust is radioactive. So for the clean rooms and the radon daughters can also play it out on the surface. So we did all of those controls uh, here at the School of Mines where we analyzed the samples of the assembly at Sanford Lab and made at Sanford Lab sure that we built the best possible detector with the least amount of radioactivity in it. And also we need to analyze the detector components themselves with alpha and gamma ray assays and perform calibrations. That's also what my group is focusing on. So here we see a busy plot, but the most important thing to notice is that LC here, the green arrow, will soon become the world's best dark matter experiment. So here's the cross-section for searching for those WIMPs. The smaller, the more sensitive we are in our limit. And here's the wind mass on the x-axis. And you see we're poised to get the best possible sensitivity. And then if you don't find dark matter, the best limit. So which should mean everything above this green dashed line, we could basically exclude for dark matter candidates, for wind candidates. And so we would become soon within about three years of running the uh, most sensitive, worldwide most sensitive experiment. And if you're lucky, we actually find dark matter, dark matter particles that can say WIMPs, for example, are the candidates for dark matter, and it would be a groundbreaking discovery. Uh, LC can do much more other physics in addition. And I mentioned, for example, the search for neutrinos double beta decay that we can do to get a comparable, even better result than the Viruana demonstrator that was also conducted and is still there. You can look at it and it's still ongoing some studies uh, at the Davis campus. So really stay tuned. I ask you for that for our LC results over the next three years. So it's going to be a very interesting time uh, of physics coming out of the Davis uh, campus particularly, because there we have the LC experiment. And I cannot disclose because we're in a race with uh, another experiment, it's not a Xeno experiment, so that's why I cannot show many pictures, that's why I cannot say much about it, because we're in a head-to-head -head race with another experiment. So, but stay tuned, we'll soon have some first results and the next, uh, over the next three years. More than that, you see in principle there's some other parameter space if you would not find uh, dark matter uh, candidates, or even if you find it, you want to measure it more precisely. So there are currently also efforts underway to build a third generation dark matter xenon experiment, where actually we will end up joining forces with our competitor experiment. And that is already in the planning, but that's on a time scale of order 10 years and beyond that. So the next couple of years will be also very exciting for results coming out from uh, experiments conducted at uh, the Sanford Underground Research Facility regarding physics results that are actually fundamental physics results. Then I stop here and thank you for your attention. And then I'm happy to take any questions that people have. Thank you, Dr. Reichenbacher. Um, there was a couple questions. Uh, Mario asked, how do neutrinos propagate through the earth? Are there parallels to EM propagation? Uh, That's an excellent question. How they propagate through the earth? They're weakly interacting. So they basically, uh, barely interact. So it's basically, if you want to shield neutrinos at that energy, you would need a lead tier, a light tier of lead basically to shield it. So it's not possible. 
So, uh, well, but you know, occasionally they can interact in the earth, but that's reducing the flux of neutrinos only marginally. But what happens is actually uh, due to the uh, an effect, a matter effect, it can actually affect the uh, oscillation probability somewhat. So that's why we have to take this into account. So it's not that they would interact and no farmer in Iowa or so has to be worried that, you know, they're radiated. Uh, first of all, the earth is curved, so it's not going directly through them. But second, you know, it's uh, really, you know, they're, they're the, time, the number of interactions that would happen is uh, minuscule. And, but we need to take the effects into account because it can alter the oscillation probability. And in fact, that is actually something we have designed the experiment for. It's actually a good thing that we have that. And it's also happening for the neutrinos in the sun, for example. That is one of the effects in the sun, the uh, Michaelis Mern of Wolfenstein effect that actually helped us. Nature was kind that we can actually detect for solar neutrinos the uh, neutrino oscillations. Um, he, Mario also asked, as I'm going through the list, is the excavated rock processed for gold? Yeah, good question. So in principle, we could, but I think there's an agreement, we must not. So that has to go into the open cut. There's an agreement with the former uh, owner of the mine and also with the Native Americans. So uh, all of the rock just has to go in the open cut. And so, uh, but also there's not so much left really in gold that uh, it might be worth it. But that's a good question that always comes up, you know, and uh, I think even if we can, we as legally are not allowed to. Okay. Um, Neil says, what is the project cost for constructing the detectors and support tunnels? So I assume that refers to Dune, where we're currently doing this. Yeah, so uh, the exact amount, I cannot tell, but you know, it's clear you know, that, uh, that Dune itself with the accelerator complex in Chicago and also the excavation building of the detectors with more than a thousand collaborators all around the world is of the order of billions of dollars of an experiment. So, uh, it's much cheaper than Large Hadron Collider, for example, at CERN in Geneva. But it's clearly, you know, you could not build this uh, for less than a billion dollars. Uh, that is also clear. And so okay. the detectors at Sanford Lab, you know, it's clearly a sort of, you know, several hundred million project that's clear. So all in all, as it will go on for decades, right? This is a very costly project. And so, you know, the, the, the ballpark number is, you know, uh, we probably need, you know, a billion order, you know, of that. That's probably fair to say. And I don't want to say anything wrong because that's a, a sensitive issue. And also it's not so simple how you do the accounting with uh, in-kind app, you know, in-kind contributions versus, uh, you know, direct purchase of equipment and so on. So there, that's not such a simple, uh, a simple answer. But yes, it is, uh, and uh, it is the biggest ongoing experimental effort in the United States of any experiment. That is fair to say in this Thank you. Okay. Um... I know, oh, how many students, undergrads, grads, et cetera, are involved with the experiments? Well, I have four students and uh, all together with undergrads, seven in my group. And so we have several PIs working on this at a school of mines. So uh, here from the school of mines, I would say, you know, we have uh, in Dune, we have uh, already I would order, you know, tens to 20, students and undergrads uh, involved in this, just in the Dune project. And LC, because we're in a hot phase right now with the LC dark matter experiment, it's uh, similar. So altogether, I would estimate uh, graduate students and you know undergrads, we have uh, 30, 
students also at least uh, more or less involved in this here from the School of Mines. Okay. Just just add, just add a little bit to that. Uh, uh, and not all of them are, are physics students either. Uh, we have a fair number of mechanical engineers uh, and an, an electrical engineer uh, undergraduates who are doing uh, either work for pay or, or uh, senior design projects uh, related to uh, either, either Dune or uh, LZ research. We also work with mineral industries and there's a lot of overlap and uh, so uh, when things take off with uh, Dune particularly, there will be a uh, much more involvement also of, of other departments. And there uh, was also a time where was planning an integration facility here before it was decided that uh, this will be all done underground. Although if someone worked underground, they know how much of a uh, uh, backbreaking job that is. And so this might just come back to us in some form, maybe that's a smaller form again, that here at the School of Mines, we do some uh, pre-assembly and testing and integration of detector components for the experiments there. And then of course, there will be many more uh, departments also that are involved. Electrical engineering would be very suitable, mechanical engineering and uh, <clears throat> Everything that has to do with industrial engineering. For example, I was working with four undergrads from industrial engineering, where we actually simulated in a computer the entire process of assembling the wire chambers where the charge is being read, uh, read out, including the photon detectors where also light can be read out, how that would be assembled here in Rapid City in a new building. And so we had it all simulated uh, for industrial engineering uh, undergrads in a computer to make sure we have the large, uh, a large enough footprint for that facility and that all the logistics of the assembly stations actually work out. That's nothing you wanna leave only to physicists. Okay. Let me see if there's any other questions there. Again, if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat and we'd be happy to answer them. Um, I know we're over time, so I don't want to be mindful, everyone, um, but feel free, yes, if you have any questions, we'll drop them in. And then, um, as always, let me put this here, there, I always like to ask for feedback, so um, I will drop a survey link in the chat. And then we are looking to plan the upcoming 2020 to virtual series talk. So if there's a topic or um, a, or even if you're interested in speaking, use the um, survey to kind of let us know and I'll reach out to you after that. So I really appreciate it. And then we do have a couple other talks to finish out the end of the year. Um, civil engineering is going to be giving a department update. Civil and environmental engineering is gonna be given an update Thursday, December 2nd at 11. And then energy for sustainability um, will be our next digital lunch and learn um, December 16th. So it's crazy to think this year has just flown right on by. And I'll drop the links for those in the chat. So if you'd like to register for them, um, please feel free. So, and always feel free to reach out if you um, would like the slides or um, we'd be happy to share them if we were able to. So, so thank you, Dr. Reichenbacher. Yeah, thanks for the invite and thanks for everyone who participated and was interested in the subjects. Yes. We really appreciate it. And if you're in town, feel free to reach out. And if you have time, you know, usually we can do this on a short notice. Uh, they can visit our laboratories, for example. Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. You too. Have a great day.